system you are about to see is based on the theories of individuals. These ideas are personal opinions and not necessarily those of the producers or TLC. An amazing theory. Could it be true? Did extraterrestrials come down to Earth thousands of years ago, imparting wisdom and technology to our ancestors? One man says yes. We have been visited by beings from another world. More than 30 years ago, Eric von Daniken challenged science with his controversial book and radical ideas. Now he's back with new clues that he contends are evidence of close encounters long ago. From Egypt to Turkey, from South America to Antarctica, we will travel the world in search of evidence and artifacts that von Daniken believes prove his theory. We are not alone. Life may have been found on Mars. Is it possible that new planets deep in space could support life? Today, we explore our own planet. Are there signs that someone found us before we could find them? Chariots of the Gods. The mysteries continue. With Eric von Daniken. Hosted by Richard Karn. The universe. An infinite mystery. For thousands of years, human beings have looked to the night sky with awe and wondered, is anybody out there? At the end of the 20th century, we have finally discovered clues that there may be life on another planet, Mars. If this is in fact true, life started there. The first evidence ever that life started anywhere else besides the Earth. We're now on a doorstep to the heavens. What a time to be alive. Its implications are as far-reaching and awe-inspiring as can be imagined. This stunning discovery marks a turning point in human history. But there's more. The razor-sharp eyes of the Hubble telescope pierce the darkness of deep space, looking for more clues that we are not alone. New planets have been found that could support some kind of life. I personally believe there are other civilizations. There are other living creatures in other solar systems. Is it possible that these living creatures found us before we could find them? Challenging long-held scholarly opinion, Eric Von Daniken believes there's controversial new evidence that could prove extraterrestrials may have come down to Earth long ago. Welcome to Chariots of the Gods. The mysteries continue. I'm Richard Karn. And for the next hour, we're going to explore two profoundly important questions. Are we alone in the universe? And if not, have we ever been visited by beings from another planet? Don't answer yet. We're just beginning our journey of discovery. Teotihuacan, Mexico. Almost eight square miles of pyramids and platforms. Experts believe construction started around 100 BC. When the Aztecs arrived a thousand years later, they were awed by the massive ruins and dubbed Teotihuacan the city of the gods. This is where Eric and I begin our journey. Well, Richard, we just climbed halfway <laughs> to the pyramid of the moon. The people that built this, did they call it the pyramid of the moon? We are not certain about this, but in the 16th century, there was a monk with the name of uh, Bernardina de Sahagún, and he asked the locals about this place at Teotihuacan. Uh -huh. They told him that this was the pyramid of the moon, and over there, we have the pyramid of the sun. The people who constructed this vast city possessed a sophisticated knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and engineering. Eric von Daniken believes the builders of Teotihuacan might have been taught the secrets of our solar system by teachers from above. This here is called La Avenida de los Muertos, the Avenue of the Dead. This represents a model of our solar system. For every planet, there is a construction, a building. 
There are nine planets in our solar system, all orbiting around the sun. Mercury is nearest to the sun. Pluto is the furthest. At Teotihuacan, each one of the planets is represented by a building, ruin, or marker. Eric von Daniken believes it is a remarkably accurate scale model of our solar system. On the hill behind the pyramid of the moon are the ruins of temples which could represent the last planets discovered in our solar system, Neptune and Pluto. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me that the planets are moving this way, and then on the other side of this pyramid, there is some representation of Pluto. Absolutely correct. Now, there Pluto is... was, was discovered in this century. So, here we have the mystery. How could they know about Pluto? I would suggest they must have had teachers from heaven, teachers from the sky. Does that mean a priest that is interpreting his gods? or I really mean from heaven. That means being from outer space. Let's call them extraterrestrials. And I would not suggest this if we would have only this example or this indications, but we have them all over the world, as I will show you. By the way, the Pyramid of the Sun uh -huh. once was covered with mica, at least the top of it, that's for sure. Well, how, now, how did they know that? In the beginning of this century, when the first excavations were made, they found the mica still on the top. Now, because mica is quite expensive here, mm -hmm. they don't have uh, natural mica, they mm -hmm. sold it. Is, is mica this? mined here? I mean, is no, there, are there mica... No, no, not in deposits? this region, no. no. Now, the next mica mine would be in North America. But, you know, it must have been a shining pyramid, shining up to the sky. Now, come on, Richard. I want to show you a real secret of Teotihuacan. Something which has never been shown on TV. It's not open to the public because uh, archaeology wants to keep it as a secret. Now look in here. This is the mica. Oh, wow. You said this was recently discovered? Well, about 15 years ago. And they, they, they lock it up? They don't allow the public to see this? Because they have no answer. They don't know what to explain to it. It's, it, it's a mystery. But mica has uh, different properties. Uh -huh. For example, mica is heat resistant up to uh, 800 degrees uh, Celsius. Well, the, the Apollo spacecraft used mica. That's correct. And also the, the lunar module, you know, the landing right. thing on the moon, used mica for, uh, against heat. Mica also is an extreme electric uh, insulator. Uh -huh. At the same time, uh, mica is resistant against all sorts of acids. Wh whoever did it must have known something about the property because this mica does not exist in the region. They had to take it from somewhere far, far away. You mean they didn't mine this here? No, absolutely well, you, well, you told us earlier that the whole top of the Sun Pyramid was covered in mica and was sold off over the years. That's correct. It was glittering and shining throughout space. We have traveled halfway around the globe to Egypt, one of the oldest civilizations on the planet. Rising from the mist of ancient history are the most famous monuments on Earth, and among the least understood. Dominating the Giza Plateau is the Great Pyramid. Who built this incredible edifice? Historical documents credit the mighty Pharaoh Khufu, also known as Cheops, and his army of 100,000 workers. But Von Daniken believes an important new discovery may support his controversial theory of the pyramid's construction. He believes the real builder was Enoch of the Ethiopian apocalyptic writings. Eric von Daniken believes that Enoch was warned by gods from the sky that a great flood would destroy civilization. Enoch built the Great Pyramid to protect ancient texts from the rising waters. He designed secret chambers carved deep inside this mountain of stone. Were the gods who foretold the coming of a flood really extraterrestrials? Von Daniken believes the answer may still be hidden inside the pyramid.
The interior of the Great Pyramid is a marvel of engineering skill. A long tunnel leads to the magnificent Grand Gallery. At the top of the gallery, Von Danigan believes there are more clues that it was Enoch, not Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid. This is the so-called King's Chamber. Simply gigantic. As you can see, there are absolutely no hieroglyphs. Empty. If Khufu was a tyrant, then the wall should be full of inscription praising himself or his gods. Von Danigan believes the blank walls of this chamber indicate the pyramid was not created to serve as Khufu's tomb. But there's more. Many wonder how the pyramid was built. Could an ancient culture assemble two and a half million giant stone blocks with such perfection, less than one-tenth of a degree off true north? Eric von Danigan believes these mysteries could support his theory that the Great Pyramid was built by Enoch at the request of extraterrestrials, teachers who descended from the heavens. If so, where are the secret chambers filled with ancient texts? Only recently has modern technology allowed investigators new ways to attempt to unravel this great mystery, which has challenged scholars and archaeologists for thousands of years. Some ancient text says that this pyramid was constructed before the Great Flood and many secret chambers should be in here. Could this shaft maybe lead to one of these chambers? In 1993, German engineer Rudolf Gattenbrink designed and built a small robot to explore the mysterious shaft. Dubbed Upawat for opener of the way, the tiny robot was equipped with a video camera and remote steering. Its mission, follow the shaft into the darkness in hopes of discovering ancient secrets hidden for thousands of years. I had no clear idea what I should find at the end of the shaft. I expected anything, but not especially this. Upawat had climbed 60 yards into what was thought to be merely a symbolic shaft. But when the little robot's journey ended at a stone door with two corroding copper fittings, Eric Von Danigan believes the legend of Enoch may be one step closer to becoming fact. What we see in the camera from the robot is just the backside of the stone. Gottenbrink believes the stone might have been lowered into place by means of a rope. The copper fittings would have prevented its removal. Could this door lead to the secret chambers Enoch was told to build by the teachers who descended from the sky? There are hundreds of references contained in the oldest Egyptian texts which tell us that the gods concealed a great secret at Giza. In my view, we now know that there is a hidden chamber inside the Great Pyramid, and we now know from seismic work that there is a hidden chamber under the Great Sphinx. We need to know what lies in those chambers, because the ancient Egyptian texts tell us that it will be a matter of enormous importance that could contain a startling revelation about the origins of human civilization. Eric von Danigan suggests that as at Teotihuacan, this could be another tantalizing clue that extraterrestrials may have visited Earth in ancient times. A scientific mission to look behind the small stone door with a tiny camera awaits approval from Egyptian authorities. Only then will we come closer to solving the mystery of who built the Great Pyramid. Still ahead on Chariots of the Gods, the mysteries continue. The mysteries continue. At the end of the 20th century, we take the idea of human flight as a given. Our space shuttles head towards space so often few people even notice when they leave or when they return. And it all started with the Wright brothers 100 years ago. Or did it? 
The dream of flying has fueled our imagination for thousands of years. At the end of the 20th century, we're not only able to fly around the Earth, we're able to explore other planets and other solar systems. Is it possible that other intelligent beings shared our dream of exploration and visited the Earth in their own space vehicles? These illustrations were drawn from descriptions in the Hindu text of ancient India dated to the 4th century BC. They describe what some scholars believe are giant vimanas or flying machines. In Yugoslavia, images like these were found on a medieval fresco dated to around the 15th century. Are these the products of an artist's imagination or are these the recordings of actual beings in flight? The the oldest scriptures of mankind, the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts, the Vedic texts of India, and many other ancient texts from all around the world make intriguing references to what sounds like flight, technological flight, not visionary imaginary journeys in the sky, but journeys in machines. Our search for clues about the flying machines of the ancient world takes us to southern Mexico. The ancient city of Palenque is one of the most magnificent of the Mayan culture, which flourished all across Central America for almost 600 years. This is the burial pyramid of Pakal, ruler of the Mayan world around 600 AD. Here we find what Eric von Danigan believes are signs that the Mayans may have encountered visitors from the sky. Pakal's ornate sarcophagus is rendered in exquisite detail. The lid is a beautifully carved image of the dead king. Eric von Danigan believes this relief might show Pakal in some kind of spaceship. Look closely. Pakal is seated in the reclined position like an astronaut in a space capsule. His hands seem to be gripping the controls, almost like an airplane pilot. His nose appears to be attached to a breathing apparatus. The design behind the seat could be a representation of flames like those from a rocket ship. Von Danigan travels to the jungles of Tabasco and points to what he believes is a clue that ancient astronauts have indeed visited this culture. During this journey, I showed clues for an extraterrestrial visit in the past. But I have more. Six years ago, a gigantic engraved stone was found in the jungle of Tabasco in Mexico. Now you see yourself. There is a flying being, to my view, an extraterrestrial floating down from the sky. His head has a helmet and with a little imagination one can even recognize a microphone on his lips. His two arms and hands are looking down while on the contrary his legs towards the sky. In this case I definitely see an astronaut coming down from heaven to teach humanity. If this were the only evidence we have of visits to the ancient world by beings who could fly, it'd be easy to say it's all just fantasy. But sometimes you have to look down to look up. Nazca, Peru, one of the great mysteries of the ancient world. From the ground, Nazca is an empty, endless desert. But from the air, the secret of Nazca is revealed. The desert is in fact a tapestry of elaborately carved lines and figures stretching for more than a hundred miles. From the air, you can see the famous figures of the spider, the hummingbird, and the monkey. Without the ability to fly, 
Experts don't know how the Nazcans gained the perspective needed to create such elaborate figures on such a huge scale. There's even disagreement about the purpose of these markings. Originally, they were thought to be calendar-related or astronomical guides. No one really knows. But there's more to Nazca than this ancient menagerie. The real mystery in Nazca are lines, gigantic lines looking like airstrips, and small lines, long, long, kilometers long. One of these lines extends 15 miles to the horizon. A giant mountaintop has been sheared off, leveled, and scraped clean to create an impressive runway-like avenue. The question is, why? Did the ancient Nazcans need runways for some kind of flying machines? This is an amazing mystery. Orthodox history has it that the ancients could not fly that they did not have the technology to fly. If the ancients did have the technology to fly, then the whole basis of our history is completely up the creek. So if the Nazcans couldn't fly, what is the purpose of all these runway-like creations? Eric von Danigan thinks he has an answer. His theory? Spaceships landed and left marks on the desert floor. When they returned into the sky, the natives wanted them to come back. Generation after generation, they recreated these lines in tribal ritual, even though the initial visit may have fallen into their past. There is one more clue that the ancient Nazcans may have had a close encounter with extraterrestrials. The figure of El Astronado has watched the skies over Nazca for as many as 3,400 years. Could this strange-looking image be a greeting from a primitive but friendly society to airborne visitors? Only if and when extraterrestrials return to Nazca, Peru, Will the mystery of these lines and figures finally be solved? If some kind of flying machine or vimana did visit the Earth in ancient times, one can imagine the terror some people may have felt in their presence. In Turkey, the eerie landscape is dotted with hundreds of small caves in the soft volcanic rock. But the real mystery of this region can't be seen above ground. Perhaps 2,500 years ago, elaborate cities were carved deep under the earth. Were these intricate maze-like settlements a primitive air raid shelter to protect the citizens from airborne enemies? There are caves and chambers all over. One of these cities descends 130 feet underground through as many as 18 stories. This is just one of nearly 200 subterranean cities in the region. Perhaps 30,000 people once lived in them. A tunnel five miles long link two cities together. Experts say the underground cities have been used for many different purposes over the last 2,500 years. Eric Von Danigan wonders why did generation after generation seek refuge beneath the earth? If fleeing an invading army or religious persecution, frightened citizens could have hid in the mountains above ground. Why did people burrow a labyrinth of subterranean chambers underground? What was the true purpose of these cities? These people were hiding out, afraid of some enemy. But all this doesn't make sense. Any enemy could simply come in here or they were sitting in a trap. It must have been an airborne enemy. 
An enemy from the sky. Still ahead on Chariots of the Gods, the mysteries continue. Why did an ancient culture deform the heads of their children? Then, did extraterrestrials leave a message for us in the giant stones of France? Plus, Eric von Danigan investigates whether visitors from another world taught the ancient Egyptians the secrets of electricity. Engine England to hundreds of other sites throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas. There are ancient structures made from giant stones called megaliths. One of the most impressive megalithic sites in the world is in the Brittany region of France near the town of Karnak. Eric von Daniken has spent years investigating this silent stone monument to our mysterious past. He believes these stones could not have been moved and arranged by primitive man without the help from teachers, teachers from above. At least 7,000 years ago, our ancestors created thousands and thousands of stones and they arranged them in lines, straight lines for miles and miles. They loom like giant soldiers marching in formation to the sea. These are the megaliths of Karnak in France. Now this is the largest megalith ever moved in ancient Europe. It's man-made, cut, as you can see. Once the whole piece was over 60 feet and its weight was 350 tons. If these giant stones were moved and arranged 7,000 years ago, they would be among the oldest creations on the planet. But were they created by human beings? At that time in human history, our ancestors were still hunter-gatherers, struggling daily for survival. Their tools were primitive, and the wheel had not yet been invented. How were these thousands of stones transported, and what was their purpose? Until today, archaeology has no answer for this mystery. Well, since we have computer technology, and since we know how to fly, we might have an answer. Eric von Danigan reveals his theory that based on aerial reconnaissance, the builders of these alignments had a sophisticated understanding of geometry, triangulation, and the Pythagorean theorem. But these stones were arranged 4,000 years or more before the Greeks supposedly invented geometry. Eric von Danigan wonders who taught the megalithic builders their math lessons. He believes extraterrestrials came to Earth and encoded a message in the stones of Karnak. What is this message? Could these megaliths point to a place in the heavens where the builders live? We just don't know. Yet. Well, what do you mean, yet? We know for sure that there is geometry. We have the pattern, we have Pythagorean triangles, but we don't know the message behind it. Maybe we have to wait until the extraterrestrials come back. Well, <laughs> you think they're gonna come back? They promised to come back. You know, what's 3,000 years in human history? Compared to outer space, it's nothing. They promised to come back, they will return. At the bottom of the world, in a land frozen in a perpetual ice age. Von Danigan believes there's more startling evidence that beings from another world left their mark on the ancients. In 1531, Arontas Phineas drew this map of Antarctica. But Antarctica supposedly wasn't discovered until about 250 years later in 1773. How could Arontas Phineas map a continent which didn't officially exist? There's a huge mystery here which scholars are not addressing and it cannot be ascribed to coincidence. What is even more mysterious than Phineas knowing about a continent that hadn't been discovered is that Phineas appears to know what Antarctica looked like before it was covered with ice. And that was 125,000 years ago. How did he know the continent's shape before it was frozen under miles of ice? 
we've only known how the subglacial topography of Antarctica looks since the 1950s when seismic surveys were taken across the ice cap. We are left to consider profound questions. Questions which force us to re-examine our ancient history. Eric von Daniken believes Arantus Phineas drew his map based on even older source maps created by extraterrestrials. Only visitors from the sky, Van Dennegan maintains, had the sophisticated technology necessary to peer through the ice to chart the landmass below. We don't know, but this map could be evidence that our planet was once surveyed from the air by beings from another world. If extraterrestrials gave these maps to humanity, the question arises, what other kinds of advanced technology may have been handed down to us from sophisticated space travelers. Eric von Danigan believes these teachers from beyond may have taught the ancient Egyptians the secret of electricity thousands of years before it was discovered by modern man. This is the temple of Osiris in Abydos in Central Egypt. One of the most mysterious gifts has come down from heaven to earth. It is the so-called jet Pilar. It has been suggested that it could be a symbol of fertility or maybe a symbol of eternity, but also a symbol of power. What power? Do they maybe mean electricity? Eric believes the Jed Pillar could have been used as some kind of electrical insulator, like you see at the top of modern power poles. But did the Egyptians have a way to generate electricity in the first place? According to Von Danigan, a strange metal-lined vessel was found not far from central Egypt. From the outside, this exact replica looks like an ordinary clay jar. But when Von Danigan pours in a common acidic liquid like vinegar, this strange jar generates electricity like a battery. Now Von Danigan searches for the ways that the ancient Egyptians might have used this electricity. In the basement of the Temple of Dendera in southern Egypt, his investigation uncovers a possible answer. In this basement, there were different crypts. And in one of these crypts, we have fantastic reliefs on the wall. Look closely. Von Danigan sees something that may look like a cord which leads to a socket. Attached to the socket might be some kind of filament and on the outside is a transparent bubble. Could this be an image of an ancient Egyptian light bulb? Van Danigan and his associates decided to test this hypothesis in the laboratory. We made a model of this electric bulb exactly in the same measurement. Would it work? Would it function? And it functioned. It works. If, as Eric von Danigan believes, extraterrestrials brought light to the temples and crypts of ancient Egypt, did a possible close encounter in South America cause some darker consequences? What you're about to see might disturb you. We are here in the Museum of Ica in Peru. This is one of the deformed skulls found in this area. Inca and pre-Inca tribes used the soft bones of their babies. They pressed it together with wood and leather. I asked myself, why have societies done this torture to their children? I think they adored someone. They copied someone. They wanted to be similar like some of their teachers from above. Up next on it.
This is Chichen Itza, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Dating back a thousand years, Chichen Itza was an important civic center to the Mayan culture that flourished in the tropical lowlands of Mexico. The Maya were fascinated with astronomy. Their observatory still stands as a testimony to their yearning for knowledge. But did the Maya have help from someone or something who understood astronomy far better than they did? To examine this question, we explore the centerpiece of Chichen Itza, a one-of-a-kind building that tells the story of its own creation like no other structure in the world. This pyramid is called El Castillo. Uh -huh. It's dedicated to the god of Kukulkan, which was the, the feathered serpent. Kukulkan was one of the teachers to the Maya. He descended from the sky. According to Von Danigan, the legend continues that after Kukulkan descended to Earth, he taught the Maya in astronomy and mathematics. There are four stairs on each side on the pyramid, and every stair has 91 steps. You take 91, four times means 364, and the top one is 365, so we have one calendar here. Surprisingly, the Mayan calendar incorporated the movements of the sun and moon, and is as accurate as our own calendar today. How is it possible that the ancient Mayans possessed this knowledge at a time when Western man thought the Earth to be flat? Let's get up here. I have to show you something really fantastic up there. Come on. Well, you know, you can read the ancient signs, but these modern ones say it's very dangerous to walk up here. Look, traveling with me is <laughs> always dangerous. I know. I was just trying to not have to climb up 91 stairs. Here, follow me. Okay. It really is beautiful. Every year, on 21st of March, a chain of light and shadow, light and shadow, descends the stairway. Not on the whole stairway, just on the corner where God Kukulkan is chiseled into stone. The Castillo is oriented in a special way, with each of its four corners facing the cardinal directions. When the sun rises during the spring equinox, the light strikes the steps at an angle. The spectacle this phenomenon creates draws thousands of people every year. On September 21st, the fall equinox, the shadow serpent rises again into the sky. Do they know that this light miracle was going to happen because of the astronomical knowledge it was a question of calculation but it, I mean it was a question of calculation that couldn't be off a fraction of an inch I mean if you're gonna build this this huge a thing you can't be wrong you can't just move it no you, you so are. they knew this before they were building it yes absolutely God Kukulkan he taught them in astronomy in mathematics they show how he descended the stairs from heaven to mankind how he left mankind again with the promise to return are you telling us that the god Kuku Khan was an extraterrestrial yes Kuku Khan was an extraterrestrial the concept of gods descending to earth is common in religions and cultures all around the world but were these fictional gods of mythology or real visitors from another world ancient astronauts who came down to Earth long ago. Similar religious legends are found in the South American country of Bolivia. At an altitude of over 12,000 feet, descendants of the Inca pay homage to their presterio, their patron saint. But over 1,500 years ago, at Tiwanaku, their ancestors celebrated their great god, Viracocha. Eric von Danigan believes Viracocha came down from the sky, bringing to his people knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, and agriculture. According to archaeologists, Tiwanaku was built in 500 AD, but others claim that it was built almost 15,000 years before that. At that time, no culture in the world could have constructed it. The mystery is, who built Tewanaku? Von Danigan believes the answer may lie a few hundred yards away in the ruins of Pumapunku.
I have reasons to believe that Pumapunku once was an Earth base of extraterrestrials. In Pumapunku, we have strange technology from another world. Stone building blocks are intricately cut with laser precision. They could have fit together like pieces of a puzzle, a sophisticated architectural achievement for a primitive culture. But Von Danigan suggests that there is more evidence that the builders of these two cities had help from teachers from the sky. This block has been etched with a perfect groove. Today, we would use a diamond tip saw to achieve this kind of accuracy, a technology only developed this century. Here lies yet another mystery few can explain. Whoever built Tiwanaku came up with a very ingenious method for holding together the huge stones which they used to build the site. They carved a groove in the edge, and into this groove they would pour a molten alloy, which later hardened into a staple. Eric von Danigan believes that extraterrestrials brought these sophisticated technologies down to the people of the region. The natives were awed by these strange visitors and worshipped them. Experts say Pumapunku was an ancient temple. But was it a place to worship gods of mythology or true living beings? Today we make a construction like a church. We say this is a temple and in here a spiritual being. The god in spirit lives in this temple. My idea is that Virakosha but not only Viracocha, other so-called gods and other places in our world were extraterrestrials and they were misunderstood as gods by our primitive ancestors. They saw these beings uh, leaving the earth with fire and smoke, and so they believed they must be gods, although they were not gods. Well, have you ever seen a UFO? Oh, good point. <laughs> Sometimes I have the impression when Eric von Däniken shows up, they run away. Uh -huh. I never saw a UFO. It's a shame. Well, if you had seen one, what would you say to them? Well, first, I would be afraid. Uh, Why? Ah, because it's strange, you know, they are not used to something like this. And then, naturally, I would try to make communication, however, uh -huh. by language or telepathy, and then I would ask some questions, a lot of questions, but the other way around, how would you react if you, of a sudden, would see a UFO? Uh, well, if it's in the distance, I w it would be fine. I'd go, wow, look, there's, <laughs> you know, but if they were confronting me, I mean, right there, I'd, I guess my first uh, thought would be, why me? Though Eric and I have never seen a UFO or an extraterrestrial, the fact remains many people claim they have. In light of this phenomenon, advanced technology may help us communicate with extraterrestrials in ways our ancestors could not have imagined. Launched in the 1970s, the Pioneer satellite first explored Jupiter. After a close encounter with the largest planet in our solar system, Pioneer continued its journey into deep space. Fixed to the side of the tiny spacecraft is a gold disk. Etched on the disk are chemical symbols, a map of Earth's location in the solar system, and the figures of a man and a woman. The man has his hand raised in a friendly greeting to anyone or anything that might encounter Pioneer on its journey into the unknown. Remember El Astronado, the figure carved into a mountainside? It appears the ancient Nazcans were trying to communicate with extraterrestrials. 3,400 years later, we're still looking to the sky and wondering, is anybody out there? Chariots of the Gods will be right back. We're to consider two provocative questions. Are we alone in the universe? And if not, have we ever been visited by beings from another planet? 
For the past hour, we've explored the mysteries of the ancient world through the eyes of Eric Von Daniken. Did extraterrestrials visit the Earth, imparting wisdom and technology to our ancestors? You're going to have to decide that for yourself. But at the end of the 20th century, new technology allows us to examine our world and other worlds for signs that we might not be alone. Now our program ends here, but our search for clues, both on Earth and in the heavens, will continue. For Eric Von Danigan and anyone else out there who might be watching, I'm Richard Karn. They promised to return one day to Earth. We have this promise of returning one day. Now you ask, why not within two years? Well, every child knows that the distance between the stars are very, very uh, large. Mm -hmm. So you cannot reach such distances in short time. It always will take a few thousand years before they return. Now the last visit may have uh, took place, let's say, two and a half thousand years ago or three thousand years ago. Okay, it's time that they return. And we should be prepared for this possibility.